18-year-old has been the subject of a manhunt all day long. It was a short while ago that the governor of Massachusetts essentially said that they had lost his trail and they did not know where he was and now we have shots fired in the neighborhood and a large police presence that you can see live converging on the area. Correspondent Bob Orr is in Washington. I'm going to, as we continue to watch this video, Bob, I want to bring you in. What are your sources telling you? Well, Scott, we're in the same boat that you are, frankly. We're, we're hearing wow. reports from the scene. Uh, it's very hard to know precisely what's going on, but in watching the pictures, this is unusual movement. Earlier, we've seen a great show of force at various different locations as reports would come in and, and tips would come in. Here we have kind of a caravan of police cruisers, and it's hard to tell how far we are in this video uh, from the scene of where these shots reportedly are fired, but the police are all going in one, uh, one direction here. Uh, a sign to me that perhaps uh, something serious is going on and they're responding in an orderly fashion. I mean, this, this is something that's not completely unexpected as they squeeze down that area in Watertown uh, over the past 12 hours. Uh, they, were, they were closing that noose around that area and, and obviously with darkness coming, there was some import on the side of police to try to wrap this thing up. And we can only presume that the suspect may have been feeling some desperation as well. So we'll wait. We don't want to jump to any conclusions, but this looks like a uh, obviously dramatic development in the day. It is, and uh, you can see the police presence. You can see a uh, National Guard vehicle there, armored uh, Humvees coming through the area. All day long, more than 15 hours, there's been an intensive manhunt. The governor of Massachusetts told the people of Boston to remain in their homes, lock their doors, do not answer the door for anyone but a uniformed police officer. Then they had a news conference a short time ago, said that they had lost the suspect, and now we have these developments unfolding before our eyes. Our Don Daler is in the neighborhood of all of this, and Don, I wonder what you're seeing. Well, Scott, I can tell you a little more than five minutes ago, people here heard a number of gunshots and the police just sprang into action. Cars squealed out of the, the staging area there, headed in that direction. There is currently a massive police presence at Franklin Street. And I can tell you one of our people was on the phone with someone who lives in that neighborhood. And he suddenly said, come to my neighborhood, Dexter and Laurel, the corner of Dexter and Laurel. There are gunshots being fired right here right now as you said things appear to have calmed down for a little bit but they have ramped up now we're hearing that ambulances were dispatched and there is a number of police cars headed that way a lot of activity going it's, it's perhaps not even a half mile from where we are right now and definitely within that 20 square block search area that police have been pouring over all day long don daler at the scene uh, live pictures now of a large police response uh, no sooner did the authorities tell us that they had lost the trail of Jokar Sarnayev, the 19-year-old they are searching for in connection with the Boston Marathon bombings. No sooner did they tell us that they lost the trail than we had this sudden uh, police response, uh, shots fired in the neighborhood not far from where that search was going on. We're going to keep watching this. We're going to develop new information as we can. In the meantime, we're going to go to a report that was produced by Elaine Quijano today. As we said, much of the day in suburban Cambridge and Watertown, there were police presence, door-to-door -door searches, and a lockdown uh, of the residents there. Elaine Quijano has our story. Well, Scott, it has been a nerve-wracking day for people here in the Boston area as they lived under that lockdown. Boston and the cities surrounding it are under siege. Heavily armed police and federal agents went door-to-door -door as they searched some neighborhoods and evacuated others. Boston's public transit system, which normally serves about half a million people daily, was shut down. And the streets around the normally bustling downtown were empty as officials warned people to shelter in place. In other words, to stay indoors with their doors locked and not to open the door for anyone other than a, a properly identified law enforcement officer. Carrie Smith and her boyfriend Ryan Brown said the city is unrecognizable. And it's almost almost like a ghost, ghost town. You don't really see that many people walking around on the streets. 
um, and, and the cars, like there's absolutely no traffic. In Brookline, where nearly every business was closed, Teresa O'Connor was one of the few people who ventured outside, hoping to find a place open for lunch. It's very uncomfortable. It's very eerie and, um, you know, I wish we could get out of town, but we can't. Boston's beloved Red Sox were supposed to play a night game at Fenway Park, but by afternoon, officials had postponed it. Local colleges canceled classes as students were told to stay indoors. We could hear it on the TV, we could hear it coming through the police scanner, and then we could hear the sirens outside, so we were like, uh-oh. Natasha Nathan, a Suffolk University junior, heard gunshots from her front porch last night. When you came out mm -hmm. and you heard the sirens and you heard gunshots, mm -hmm. what did you think? I called my dad and I, um, it was just a very physical reaction. It was a flight or fight feeling almost. I was shaking, it wasn't cold out, but I was shivering. The 21-year-old who followed orders to stay home says she hasn't felt at ease since Monday. It's been a tough week. Yeah, it's, I mean, something every single day. We were going over that last night, and it's almost to the point where you just expect something to happen tomorrow. It's like a war zone, and you just don't expect Boston or any place in the United States to really feel that way. Now, late this afternoon, Governor Patrick announced that mass transit service here would be resuming, but he reminded people to be vigilant if they do go outside, Scott. Elaine, thank you. I'm going to switch back to that live picture from that neighborhood now. We have a live picture from the neighborhood where the police response is uh, ongoing. I'd like to bring John Miller and Bob Orr back into the conversation as we continue to look at this picture. Uh, the police told us about 45 minutes ago, John, that uh, they had lost the trail of the young man. Now we've heard uh, shots fired and a police response in that same neighborhood. What do you know? What we know is there was a report of a man hiding in a boat in somebody's backyard, obviously a boat that was up on blocks or something like that. Um, people started moving towards that report. Uh, the people on the scene called for a tactical team, basically a SWAT team, to respond and they wanted them to take care of, of doing any entry, entry into the boat. And then what followed was a number of shots fired, heard by uh, correspondents and witnesses on the scene. And then you saw a large police response um, going towards that location. And that's basically where we are right now. And Don Daler is in the neighborhood. Don, what do you have? Well, I have the number of people heard those shots as well, including a local CBS uh, reporter from New York, Lou Young. And he, he says that he heard a number of shots. Now, we are getting word that the police is asking that people who live in the area of Franklin Street, in that region of Laurel and Franklin Street, that they remain in their homes, that it's a very dangerous situation right now. The police vehicles continue to scream by here at a high rate of speed headed in that direction. So the police presence is only increasing in that area. Scott. Don, thank you. Bob Orr in Washington, what are you hearing? Uh, Scott, this is very chaotic, and I just want to raise just a note of caution here that uh, we don't absolutely have clarity here. I just talked to a, a, an agent en route to the scene, literally en route to the scene, and he said that he has heard all of the various press reports. He can't confirm any of them. What we think is going on, though, at least in part, some disruptive rounds, uh, some uh, canisters perhaps, or rubber bullets, some kind of disruptive rounds uh, may have been fired at this boat. It's unclear. There are conflicting reports as to whether or not there is a person in that boat. There are some reports, frankly, that say uh, that appears to be the case, but I, I would just caution everybody, we need to take a breath here and let this develop, because even the people on the scene who are responding to the event are saying to me, be careful, we don't know exactly what we have. Let's remind everyone why Boston is on such a hair trigger. It's from the events of last night when the two suspects were first encountered by the police. We have a little bit of videotape of the firefight that ensued once police had engaged the two bombing suspects. Let's have a listen to that now. There's explosions and gunfire going on down the street. Over here. 
open warfare in the city of Boston. We were told a short while ago that more than 200 rounds were fired in that fight. And John Miller has been told that the suspects threw a bomb like the one that was used at the Boston Marathon, threw that at the police. And this was the police conversation on the radio once the bomb had been thrown at them. That was last night, the wee hours of the morning, actually, and that is when one of the suspects was killed, Tamerlan Sarnayev, 26 years old. A police officer was also gravely wounded. We've heard recently from the hospital that the police officer has had surgery, is stable now, but still in critical condition. That happened last night. All day long in Boston and its suburbs, mass transit was shut down. People were told to stay in their homes as police searched a 20-block area looking for the remaining suspect, Jokar Sarnayev, the 19-year-old brother who got away from that firefight on foot and has not been seen since. So, what we're seeing now in Boston is a police response to a report of a man being found in a boat, a report of shots fired, but it's incredibly important to remember, as Bob Orr was pointing out, we don't know what this is about yet, and the police forces in the Boston area are on high alert, on a hair trigger, looking for a man that was described in a news conference uh, a short time ago as very, very dangerous and violent. So the police are going to, the police are going to uh, do everything that they can, respond big when they have reports of a suspect. Let's pause now uh, while we bring in the rest of the country for a CBS News special report. John Miller, um, the police came out about an hour ago, said that the trail had gone cold, that the young man apparently had slipped through that cordon, that 20-block cordon. Uh, we are, those of you just joining us, this is a CBS News special report. You're looking at a live picture of Watertown, Massachusetts, the suburb of Boston just across the Charles River. This is a CBS News special report. We are breaking in at this moment. Some of you are joining us from the expanded edition of the CBS Evening News. We are breaking in to show you this police action that is occurring in Watertown, Massachusetts, just across the Charles River from Boston. This has been the scene all day of a massive, intensive manhunt looking for the one surviving suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings of Monday. The manhunt has been going house to house, alley by alley, street by street, police officers, federal agents, National Guardsmen in armored vehicles. But about an hour ago, the police and the governor of Massachusetts said they had essentially lost the trail of Jokar Sarnayev, the 19-year-old that they are looking for. No sooner had they told us that the suspect had slipped through the cordon than we heard that there had been shots fired in this neighborhood near where the search was occurring. John Miller has been talking to his sources in law enforcement. John, fill us in on why we have seen all of these police vehicles racing to this location. And so I've spoken to Lou Young from uh, our New York station, WCBS, who's on the scene, and he said he heard a number of shots. He said then there was traffic um, coming over the police radio uh, that they wanted units to respond to an address on Franklin Street. And what they were saying over there was that there was uh, a person spotted on a boat in the backyard. So Lou is a primary source. Um, he hears the shots. The other information is from a secondary source. Based on my experience, you know, having been at any number of these kinds of perimeters and SWAT searches, um, this is the kind of thing that happens where you've done an entire perimeter, um, you're, you're packing up to move on, and then something will change quickly. 
a person will call 911 and say, I just saw a guy go over a fence into the next yard and he climbed into the back of a boat. And at that point, you know, you regroup and you move on that information. We don't know if the shots that people heard being fired uh, were coming from the suspect, coming from police, whether that was one-sided or two-sided. At this point, we're waiting to hear back from the people who have descended on that location on Franklin Street um, to see what they're finding there. The suspect is described by the head of the state police in Massachusetts as, quote, very violent and dangerous. And let us remind you of why the police in Boston and its surrounding suburbs are on such a hair trigger for any kind of report. All of this started to come apart for the suspects last night when they encountered police. We're not quite sure what caused that encounter to happen, but it ended in a ferocious firefight in the wee hours of the morning. Let's uh, replay that piece of video that we have of last night's firefight involving the police and the bombing suspects. There's explosions and gunfire. A going police on down the officer was gravely wounded in all of that. So now we are watching a new police action this evening. Bob Orr has been following these events. Bob, what are you hearing? Well, Scott, uh, the uh, amalgamation and the accumulation of material is starting to point to something uh, very serious and dramatic here. Uh, Mayor Menino of Boston has told our affiliate WBZ TV, and this is again attributed to the mayor of Boston that there is a man believed to be the suspect surrounded in a boat behind an address on Franklin Street. This information from the mayor uh, jives and coincides with other information we're hearing from various sources and also matches uh, traffic we're monitoring on, on police radios. We've uh, called up some maps and we're able to see uh, with aerial, you know, satellite mapping, uh, the boat they're talking about. It's a fairly sizable boat. There it is right there on your screen. Uh, just to orient you, right in the center of your screen is what we believe to be the boat. It's covered, obviously, for winter there. As you can see, the houses are fairly close together. There's some tree cover. Uh, but according to the mayor, in, in that uh, boat at that location, or I should say at that location in a boat, uh, they believe they have the suspect uh, surrounded in a fashion. So this is still uh, breaking and developing, and we're still uh, calling all sources, of course, to try to get a little more clarity, Scott. Bob, I appreciate that. Uh, Bob's information has come from the mayor of Boston, uh, Mayor Menino, and, of course, we have had fragmentary information all day long. This has been an ongoing police emergency that has drugged through the night and through the entire day. And so this may be a break in the case, but we have seen other instances today as well in which they thought they might have had the suspect cornered only to discover that he was not there. Uh, John Miller, are you hearing anything new from your sources? So they're on the scene there. Uh, what now, now they've had a great response of police who have set up in a number of directions. So what they're trying to do is reorganize the scene so that you don't have um, armed police uh, pointing their weapons in one direction and armed police on the other side pointing um, in the same direction. So what they're going to do is eliminate their crossfire. Now, if you're the tactical commander on the scene, what you're going to want to do at this moment is if you have containment, meaning you believe you have a suspect possibly in that boat, what you really want to do is slow this incident down. You eliminate the crossfire between your tactical teams, then you figure out how you can communicate with that boat first and see if you establish a dialogue. If there was an exchange of gunfire, that suspect may be injured, that suspect may be dead, but you want to see if you can establish a dialogue. And then if you can't, you want to see how you're going to approach that and look inside. And there's a number of ways to do that. Um, but I think what we're, going to, what we're going to see here is they're going to get that scene organized and then they're going to go in, into a tactical mode and figure out what they have. I want to remind the audience, the folks at home, how we got to this point. It was yesterday, 
evening that the FBI released the videotapes of the two suspects that they believe were the Boston Marathon bombers. Hours after that, police encountered the men. The men killed a campus police officer for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, killed him in his police car. Then they led Boston police and federal agents on a chase through the northern suburbs, throwing bombs back at the pursuing police cars and firing on them. When that chase came to a stop, there was a firefight in which more than 200 rounds were expended. One of the suspects, Tamerlan Sarnayev, 26 years old, was killed in that firefight. A police officer was gravely wounded in that firefight. He is in the hospital fighting for his life after surgery today. All day long, they have been looking for Sarnayev's younger brother, the 19-year-old Jokar Sarnayev, also one of the bombing suspects. He fled the firefight last night on foot and has been the subject of an intense manhunt all day long in this part of Boston. These young men spent the early part of their lives in Russia, in the Islamic province of Dagestan, right next to Chechnya. And we've just been handed information that President Obama has been phoned by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. They have spoken by phone about the Boston attack, and President Putin has expressed his condolences to the American people. Bob Orr has new information for us. Bob? Scott, again, this is a raw information, but it comes from an agent, uh, a federal law enforcement officer who is on the scene, who tells me that there is activity around that location in the boat, which we obviously know. But this is the important point. According to this uh, person, no uh, entry has yet been made. That is kind of police speak for they haven't, uh, you know, taken anybody out of that boat or, or, or gone into the boat with any kind of uh, significant force. And as we're on the air here, I'm just uh, looking at one more message. Uh, no determination yet on what exactly is in the boat, uh, but John Miller raised a point that's important. No one is running up to it, obviously. Th they're approaching this very, very carefully, and in the words here, uh, methodically. And the fear is uh, all along, if this is the suspect, we believe he's not only heavily armed, but he may have explosive devices. So you have a situation here that if they think, as John's pointed out, if they think they have a good scene, they're going to move to safely contain, safely contain, put their tactical forces uh, in an array that protects the forces. And then time is clearly, I think, on their side. So again, this is very fresh information. Uh, this is not resolved one way or the other. It's an active scene and they are moving very, very deliberately because of the concern over possible explosives, Scott. And they have every reason to be concerned, Bob, as you know, because during the firefight in the wee hours of the morning, uh, the police encountered uh, explosives. The suspects, according to the authorities, threw a bomb at the pursuing police officers that was similar in design to the bomb that was used at the marathon bombing and apparently the bomb exploded, but it malfunctioned and did not have the same force as the bombs that were used on Marathon Day. We actually have a, a bit of police radio traffic at the point in the firefight when the police were being attacked with explosives. Let's listen to that. Now, I want to be very clear, that was last night what you were listening to, but what you are seeing is a live shot from today. The point being, 
the suspects had numerous explosive devices in the firefight last night that they used to attack the pursuing police officers. When the police officers went to the home of the brothers today, they went inside and we are told they discovered a number of explosive devices, pipe bombs, for example, with fuses, and all of that material, we have now been told, was removed from the home today safely by the bomb squad there. So the police have every reason to believe, as they told us earlier, that the remaining suspect is very violent and dangerous, could be armed with explosives, and could be armed with uh, various other kinds of weapons. So. Uh, we are down the block from a house in Watertown just across the Charles River from Boston where there was a report of a man hiding in a covered boat. We have an aerial shot, a, a satellite picture of that neighborhood, if we can call that up now and have a look at this area that they're interested in. Have a look there. Uh, let's bring that aerial picture up full, if we could please, so that we can see it better. And there is the house with the covered boat in the back, in the back of the house. It is a Google map picture. And we are told that someone believed they found it, saw a man in that boat. Shots were fired. We do not know a great deal more than that at this point, whether, whether it was the suspect or not. Now, correspondent Don Daler is in the neighborhood, and he has been talking to his sources. And Don, it's very early yet. want to be very careful about what we know and what we don't know, of course, as we always are. Tell us what you're hearing. Yes. All right, here's exactly what I can tell you. Mayor Menino of Boston, as well as a source with the Massachusetts State Police, both confirmed that there is a man hiding in a boat. He is alive and shots were fired. But as you point out, we don't know if this is the suspect. The police have surrounded it. They are very carefully approaching the situation. But at this time, we can confirm just that much. There is a man, shots were fired. He is alive. His arms and legs are seen to be moving. That is a report done from the mayor of Boston and also from a source that you have in the state police. Two sources on that information, no word on who that man might be. Uh, there's been a lot of unreliable information throughout the day because the situation has been developing so rapidly, but Don Daler has two sources on this information that would seem to confirm what John Miller and Bob Orr have been telling us, that a man was seen in a covered boat, a boat that had been covered up for the winter. And you can zoom in on it there on, uh, on Google Maps. Uh, you can see the boat behind the house. This is apparently the area of interest by the police right now. We are told that shots were fired. CBS News reporter Lou Young is also on the scene. He says that he heard the shots fired. And at this point, we are waiting to see how this develops. All day long, federal agents... sign of him all day long. He was involved in a firefight with police in which his older brother Tamerlan was killed last night. The police told us that the younger Sarnayev, Jokar, got away on foot and they had not seen him since. What we are showing you at this moment is a live shot in Watertown where police we are told have encountered a man who was hiding in a boat in this area that's been searched all day. Shots have been fired, and that is about all we know. Is this the suspect? We do not know. But reporter Lou Young is, uh, is in the neighborhood, and he's been watching these events unfold. Lou, what have you seen? What have you heard? Well, uh, Scott, I can tell you that we heard the initial flurry of activity, the um, radio traffic about the man in the boat. 
uh, which we uh, took with a grain of salt, and then a call for radio silence, then a call for EMS, and uh, follow, followed by a report from shots fired. In either order, I'm not, I don't exactly recall the order, but it was a call for an EMS unit and a report of shots fired. We ran to the scene here. I am currently at Common and Mount Auburn, about three blocks from the scene. I have spoken to uh, a local resident, uh, Paul Sutherland, who said he had come out of his house after getting the all clear, or seeing the all clear uh, on the um, television, and saw uh, a group, uh, a series of uh, SWAT vehicles head down Franklin, and then heard two series of shots. He called them automatic weapons fire, and then uh, on second thought, on reflection, uh, considered that perhaps it was just a lot of gunfire. But there were two distinct uh, bursts of gunfire, two uh, distinct volleys. And then um, the uh, units that had left after uh, the news conference uh, at about 6 o'clock or so um, came rushing back. Many police uh, units are here uh, on Mount Auburn right now. There is a, um, uh, a police line going up. Uh, we are not being allowed any closer. And uh, that is really all we know. Um, but the witnesses seem to confirm what the initial uh, reports indicated, that shots indeed had been fired and that there was a man in the boat. The uh, aerials of that address indicate there is indeed a boat uh, behind that uh, house, as you indicated. Um, I can't say any more than that, but I can tell you that uh, there had been a period after the uh, governor and uh, the colonel from the uh, state police spoke that the police seem to be leaving, and they returned in force, and they are back here now, and there are lots of flashing lights on Mount Auburn Street here in Watertown. Lou Young of WCBS-TV. Lou, thank you very much. Bob Orr has new information from his sources. Bob? Just a couple of notes of caution, Scott, and a note of clarification. We, we have to be somewhat careful in some of the details we're able to give you because the one thing we do not want to do and will not do intentionally by all means is we don't want to give away any kind of uh, police operational uh, information that the suspect might be able to monitor. We don't want to be party to that. So we're going to go real slow here. The other thing, we've been showing you this uh, aerial satellite map, which we took from Bing uh, Maps, of the location 67 Franklin Street with the boat uh, there circled. And, and we've pointed out that the boat has a covering. But I just want to be real clear, this is not a satellite photo from the moment, and we're not sure uh, if the boat right now is covered with a tarp or not. This obviously was taken during cold weather months, so I just want to make sure we put all our cards on the table. Uh, I just talked a short time ago to a senior law enforcement official uh, who is waiting like we are, frankly, for some kind of confirmation from the scene, uh, but I think there is some, some optimism here that, that this is uh, the real deal. We might be looking at, and I say might be looking at, the end game. This is going to take a while, though. I want everyone to understand because at this point, if in fact the officials there, if the FBI and the Boston officials, if they feel, if they can determine to uh, certainty that they've got a suspect, particularly an armed suspect, in that boat, once they have the, the forces safely arrayed, they will uh, make a very, very calculated and careful approach. This is a man, if it is the suspect they're looking for, who has uh, already been connected to a terrorist attack, bombings that have killed and maimed people, also to the uh, shooting death of a police officer last night, the wounding of another. So he has no boundaries and has shown no mercy. And so law enforcement officials have to take all precautions, Scott. Bob, we'll be standing by to come back to you when you have new information. Thank you. Uh, let us show you now uh, who we're talking about. There, there's a photograph that we have of the immediate aftermath of the bombing. There, there's the suspect there that you see on your screen, 19-year-old Jokar Sarnayev. But we have another photograph in the immediate aftermath of the bombing. When uh, one of the bomb ha bombs has gone off and the sky is filled with smoke, here it is. People are running away down the street, across the crosswalk there, running away from the bombing. But when you zoom in and look here, there he is. Jokar Sarnayev, 19 years old, seems to be walking calmly away from the explosions on Monday after they occurred. It's photographs like this that helped the FBI identify 
Tsarnaev and his older brother, 26-year-old Tamerlan. Tamerlan, of course, as we've told you, was killed last night in a ferocious firefight with police. Bombs were thrown at the police. More than 200 rounds of ammunition were expended in that firefight. Tamerlan Tsarnaev, 26-year-old, was killed. His 19-year-old brother that you see there on the right uh, ran away from the firefight on foot and has been the subject of an intense manhunt ever since. What you're seeing now is a live picture from the neighborhood in Watertown, a suburb of Boston, where the manhunt has centered. And we have information that a man, uh, apparently hiding in a boat behind a house, was encountered, shots were fired, and we don't know anything more than that. This is a Bing satellite map of the house, and you see of the address that we're told where all of this is unfolding, and you see a boat right there behind it. So John Miller uh, has been talking to his sources in law enforcement. Uh, John, how does this unfold at this point in terms of how the police would normally handle this? Well, this is a complicated one because you've got the aspect of a dangerous suspect who's already engaged police with gunfire, but also with explosives. So you have a situation where you need the capabilities of a SWAT team, but you also need the capabilities of a bomb squad. Now, there is probably no spot right now on the planet Earth that has more tactical resources uh, right there and available than this place here. What you have on scene is uh, Boston Police SWAT Team, Massachusetts State Police SWAT Team, um, the FBI's elite hostage rescue team has been deployed from Quantico and are on the scene there. You've got the uh, Boston, Cambridge, um, and FBI special agent bomb technicians, so all those bomb squads on the scene now. The incident commander's job here is to figure out, A, do we want to be lured into a trap? So we're going to clear a path to that boat, checking for booby traps, explosives, and so on. Then um, a combination of bomb technicians and SWAT, if they can't establish a dialogue, are going to have to make an approach and decide how to look inside. And that is uh, kind of what I had said earlier and what Bob uh, Orr had reiterated, which is when you have an incident that's moving fast, you want to, you want to reset it. You want to get um, the best control you can have over it and then make it move slow. And you want to be the one behind those decisions. Earlier today, you asked um, Bill Bratton, um, how do you see this ending? And he said, in a large measure, that's going to be up to the suspect and how he reacts um, if and when he's confronted. And I think we've seen a flurry of shots fired. We don't know by whom, whether that was in one direction or two. But clearly, um, we have been reset in, a, in another location that is extremely hazardous, and they are going to be um, very methodical going forward. That's um, the, the cautionary part. The good news, if there is any in a story like this, is every conceivable resource you could want from a tactical commander's standpoint is right there. We have a photograph now, I'm told, of the front of the house. This is the location shot at another time, obviously, and there again is the boat in the back of the house. If you're just joining us, the police were called to that location. There was a report of a man hiding in the boat. The next thing we knew, shots were fired in the area. This has been confirmed by the mayor of Boston and by one source at the state police that a man was found in the boat and shots were fired. Is this 19-year-old Jokar Sarnaev? That is what we do not know. He is the surviving suspect in the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, police have been searching for him intensively all day long. The National Guard has come in with armored vehicles looking for this individual as well. There's been a house-to-house -house manhunt Ironically, they decided to have a news conference late uh, this evening and announced that they had lost him. And it probably was not 30 minutes after they announced that they had lost him that this event occurred and the shots were fired and we watched police 
zoom into this neighborhood, surround the house, and now we are waiting to find out what happens next. What you're watching there is a live picture of what's happening in the neighborhood. As we continue to watch that picture, I want to bring in Anthony Mason, who has been working with a team here at CBS News all day long to learn more about these two brothers, the Sarnaev brothers. And Anthony, what, what can you tell us about this young man, 19 years old, that the police are searching for now? Well, Scott, it's interesting. He was, he was actually spotted only yesterday afternoon at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, which is about two hours drive southeast of Cambridge, where he was a sophomore. Uh, but he was, a friend told us, a friend from both high school and college said he saw him in his room and had a 10 minute conversation with Jahar in which he seemed perfectly normal. In fact, Jahar offered him a ride to the edge of campus and then drove off saying that he had things he had to do. Um, Jahar, who as you mentioned is only 19 years old, um, was the captain for two years of his wrestling team at Cambridge Ridge and Latin High School, which is just down the road from Watertown. Uh, I spoke this afternoon with his former assistant coach, Peter Payak, who described him as conscientious, thoughtful, a leader. He said he was part of our family. I asked him for his reaction to, to the news of the bombing and, and that the 19-year-old Jahar turned out to be a suspect, and he said, I cried when I found out. He said it was like a bullet in my heart. This kid, actually 19-year-old Jahar Tsarnaev, came back to the wrestling team only just this past January to work out with the team where he was still popular. This was a team of some 28 uh, students, some of whom, many of whom were foreigners, in fact, and he said, you know, he was highly respected. So to all of the people who know Johar Tsarnaev, this is a complete mystery, Scott. The Tsarnaev family came to the United States about 2002, 2003, f fleeing the civil war and the terrorism that had beset Chechnya and Dagestan, two provinces of Russia, Islamic provinces of Russia, which had been, uh, Chechnya in particular, involved in a separatist movement that the Russian army had crushed over the last 10 years or so. The family fled all of that violence, came to the United States, and uh, just in 2012, 19-year-old Jokar Tsarnaev uh, became a United States citizen, a naturalized United States citizen. Uh, that happened in 2012, and ironically, it was on September 11th. 2012 that he became a citizen of the United States. His older brother who was killed last night was a permanent legal resident, not a citizen, but what they call a green card holder uh, here in the United States legally. Uh, their extended family is here in the United States and uh, they've been in school here for quite some time. I want to go back on the timeline over the last many hours to where we are now. Late yesterday, the FBI released video of two men that it said were suspects in the bombings on Monday at the Boston Marathon that killed three people and wounded 170. This is some of the surveillance tape that the police released. They described the man in the black hat that you see with the backpack as suspect number one, the man following him in the white hat as suspect number two. Well, it was just a few hours later that a police officer for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the great university in Boston, police officer Sean Collier was murdered in his police car. A 26-year-old officer who had been on the force there at MIT for just about a year. He was killed. About 10 minutes later, not far away, a car was hijacked by two armed men. This is all according to our police sources. The hijackers threw the driver of the car out unharmed, and then they led the police on a chase through these northern suburbs of Boston. During that chase, bombs were thrown at the police in the pursuing vehicles. Gunfire was exchanged among the pursuing vehicles. 
When the chase came to an end about one o'clock, there was a ferocious firefight. Let us play the audio for you.